Uh, good afternoon. There's been a lot of talk on the EV industry, and I think last one year has been a momentous year as far as announcements and pronouncements go. We had the FAME policy coming in March, 10,000 crores, 10 lakh two-wheelers, 5 lakh three-wheelers, 55,000 trucks, 70,000 70, cars. Then we had the announcement of the government in terms of support, in terms of income tax, in terms of import duties. We also had some state governments coming out of the policies. And a week back, there was a major announcement in terms of charging infrastructure by the environment minister. So a lot is happening in terms of announcements and pronouncements. Now, how much of these announcements and pronouncements get activated on ground 2020 will be the year reckoning. So our topic for today is the learnings and unlearnings from EV global players. Now, if you talk of learnings, there's a saying in English, there's those who don't learn from history stand condemned by it. So if we don't learn from history, we are condemned. But there's a converse saying also, those who follow history blindly also stand condemned by it. So you have to choose where you stand and you choose very carefully. I think one of the discussions we'll focus on this approach. But we've got a very distinguished panel with us, which I'd like to introduce to them, their organization. Uh, Mr. Zeng is there, Ketsu is there. He's the executive director of BYD India. Please give him a big hand. BYD as a company is making major inroads and uh, if you talk of public transportation, they are the world's number one, presence in about 50 countries, already about 200,000 vehicles on road in India. They are leading the pack as far as uh, EV buses is concerned and uh, if the recent announcement goes, they're also moving into the MVPV space. Incidentally, BYD stands for build your dreams. Am I right, Mr. Yes. So if I have to translate in Hindi, Apne sapne khud dekhiye sakar kijiye. We'll translate to Hindi later. Uh, on my right is Mr. Pankaj Munjal. He's the MD and CEO of uh, Hero Cycles. And uh, if I can only say, like we have the first family in the film industry, the Kapoors, and if there's a first family in the auto industry, it's the Munjals. So he represents that family. Uh, he's a... Hero is the world's largest manufacturer of bicycles, five lakhs a month, I assume now, or it's more than that now. But I think that's something Mr. Munjal is not the person who rests on his laurels. He's moving into a big way and he's talking with a passion that why should a country like India, where people still one third of the population walks to work, why can't they be mobile? And electrification of bicycles, which is not a very discussed topic, that's his passion, that's his interest, along with golf, which is also interest. On my left hand side is uh, Mr. Chetan Many, needs no introduction. He's the one who started when nobody in the industry, nobody in the country talked of EVs. He talked of it in a decade back. And uh, he was the founder of and the creator of the first electric car, the Reva. And now he's moved to newer pastures. He's the CEO, CF, uh, the VC, the vice chairman of Sun Mobility, which is into the infrastructure space. and he's doing a lot of pioneering work in mobility and own as you pay. I can only say about Chetan Many, you know, when he studied history, he used to say, who's the grand man, old man of India? Dada Bhai Naroji. Now, if I have to say who's the grand old man of the EV industry, it is Mr. Chetan Many. Only thing is, he's not the grand old man, he's a grand young man. And unlike the long beard, which Dada Bhai Naroji has, he has a small mustache. And then we have the left side, Nomura uh, Research uh, uh, Organization, which is a pioneer in technology, a pioneering technology consultancy and a think tank. And Ashim Sharma is a partner there. He's got loads of knowledge and information. Don't go by his boyish looks and boyish charm and his boyish smile. A lot of knowledge, a lot of information resides and he'll be giving a lot of perspective what he see the industry is evolving. And last but not the least is Mr. Winkesh Gulati. He's the vice president of FADA. Federation of Automobile Dealers Association, that's the voice of the customer or the voice of the market into the industry. And uh, he brings in a lot of passion, intensity, a lot of knowledgeable. I've known him for two decades, and he's a person who doesn't mince words when it comes to speaking the truth. So that's the extinguished panel. We'll start right away, and I think the one of the areas which you want to say, what are the learnings from major EV markets? We'll talk of the learnings before which you think are applicable to India. Mr. so you come from China has got more than 50% of the EV market or 60% and BYD is leading the pack. I mean, BYD is everywhere. 
what are the learnings which you think the global market or Chinese market can come to India which are relevant for India? Okay, uh, it's my honor to be here today at this stage and thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Actually, before I talk about the learnings from the Chinese market, I would like to say what the learning I get from Indian market. The truth, if you want to understand what is happening in this emerging industry in India and if you want to what will happen in, in India in the coming times, you have to follow up Etiotos, that you will get always get the latest information. Okay, let's coming back to the point. Actually, uh, you know, uh, you know, Chinese is uh, China. Uh, Chinese market is right now the best market for e mobilities. Now, the global market share is uh, more than fifty five percent. And uh, why, you know, and how the Chinese got, uh, Chinese market is growing so. Uh, dramatically, I think one of the most important part is, uh, you know, the Chinese government giving priority to the public transport, and they are giving, giving the importance to the public transport. Why? Because you know, uh, in China, you know, the public transport is only two percent of the total motor vehicles, but con contributing thirty percent of the pollutions. And, uh, and another fact is, uh, you know, only 8% 8, 8 of the logistic and construction vehicles is contributing another 30% of the air pollution. So, you know, if, you, if we want to reduce the air pollution, and, if we, and, and also one more thing, you know, uh, one bus, one diesel bus, the emission is equal to uh, around 30 numbers of private cars. At one taxi, diesel taxi or petrol taxi, the emission is equal to around 10 private cars. This is a situation in China. So we are giving the importance, are giving the, import, the priority to, to public transport. So I think this is a very good, very good point which we can learn from China and we should also to see how we can take the, f the same forward in India. Thank you. So Mr. Singh talked of a very important point that public transportation is which is the challenge and which can reduce the pollution footprints and which is the answer to India's problems even. And BYD is leading the charge on this. So public transportation, the focus, which is also visible in, to some extent in the FAME policy, is the answer for India. Yes. So right. you say public transportation should take precedence over personal transportation. Yes, we think so, yes. So that's something. So people who are in the personal transport, uh, you can talk to him after the break. Uh, Pankaj, your company is the world leader in bicycles and uh, you're exporting to many countries. And I've seen that in the last few years, uh, you haven't rested on your laurels you have moved into the, also the concept of how this public transport, which is the moon personal transport, which is the backbone of the Indian country, how can it be electrified? And although not, not much is discussed on this at this point in a number of forums. So I'd like to have your perspective on this. And what are the learnings you have got from the evolved markets where EV bicycles are running? What can be relevant for India? So Arun, earlier to that, uh, I want to share. In 2008, I went for a conference and big announcements of EV and this is going to happen and this is going to happen and there were ministers and everybody. So I had to change my car. So I said, wait, we'll wait for the EV. So 2009 happened, 2010 happened, nothing really happened. So I sat in my old car. Again in 2010, 12, there were big announcements and it was EV world and this is going to happen. Nothing happened, so I'm still sitting in the old car. 2015-16, so rightly what you're talking about, the announcements and the ground reality, they are not absolutely in line. But what we noticed in Hero was, we will like to dominate. Whatever business we are going to uh, do, get into, we should have world market share, and that's what we are uh, trying to do. We looked at Europe. The e-car, the EV did not come as per the plan, but the e-bikes, they were a solution. Small countries, large countries in Europe, GDP grows by 2%, then this population is 0.2%. E-bike market went up by 20%. Not one year, five years, 10 years. 
two, two decades, for 20 years, e-bike has been the solution. So Hero looked around, we went deep into this, we've gotten the best technology from Japan, we bought a company in Germany, right next to Tesla Motors, I'm sure we'll do some work there. Uh, bike integration and uh, bike assembly. India, maybe we've got facilities all around. So, Hero is now ready, and our e bikes, we will have some world share in this. So, we are planning for a 9 to 10 percent share in the world market, and I too believe e EV story will be the e e uh, that cycle story in the country. So, Pankaj mentioned even in the most. But I'm yet sitting in my old car from 2008. That's a big problem. Okay. <laughs> So, Pankaj mentioned that even in the most evolved and developed markets, they are realizing the real solution will be e-bikes and e-cycles. And if you don't, if you overcome that, and if you don't do that, and it will be more relevant in India. So, that's a learning which has come in, and that has to be in the radar of the policy makers, and as his heroes playing a pioneering role in this. Chetan, you have seen the world market. I mean, you've seen, uh, we talk of Norway, we talk of Britain, we talk of Japan. What are the learnings which you think, and we'll get into what is to be done for India later on, but what are the good learnings which you think is applicable to the Indian market? Um, so I think that uh, having sold product earlier in 24 countries, I found one thing that was very common among customers everywhere, and that product cost, range anxiety, and long refueling time were key barriers at different perspectives that had to be addressed, and this is very clear. And so I think that solutions that would resolve those would be the ones that would be um, definitely the ones on growth. And those are the things that we should focus on. The second um, learning for me was, um, especially when we had a chance to rebrand product, is to make electrics really cool. Um, and we had the opportunity in UK to do it. And so you had film actors and RJs and chairmen of bank. And all of a sudden, electric became cool. And that became a good way to push it more than just being green or economically viable, but can you also put a cool factor to that, especially with the younger generations that becomes quite relevant uh, in terms of what the learning was on this area. The third, I felt that countries that had very long-term policies, um, uh, at least five years clarity, once had shown a lot of success in terms of penetration of EV markets on this area. And that these policies were beyond just the subsidy side of it, but they were also softer areas. So for example, um, when we launched in UK, I remember you would pay five pounds a day if to enter on a congestion charge unless you drove electric, right? Today it's probably eight pounds or 10 pounds. Um, in California, you could use an HOV lane. Uh, in Oslo, you could drive into the city using the bus lane, right? So there were a lot of softer drivers on this area that enabled a push of initial electric mobility on this front. The, um, the other part was that the, the core development of an ecosystem, the infrastructure that came out, installation at homes, installations at outside, the financing, the insurance, these, the technology part, uh, these were all co-developed. So if you re realize why California became very successful, in the 90s, California started to change its aerospace industry to electric mobility, right? Those are the early days when I'd spent 10 years there, and that allowed a lot of the Teslas to come five years later on this front, on this area, right? And I think the last thing, which is very important and often neglected, um, when we start to look at electric mobility at mass deployment, is going to be safety, right? So, um, you know, cities getting their fire and their police and everyone understood what it is to deal with safety related to electric vehicles on this area. So when we've launched, for example, the Ashok Leyland in Ahmedabad, we actually were the first people to train the entire fire department all the way to the chief marshal. Uh, on what to do when you have issues related to areas. So these things, it's about also creating an ecosystem that's going to be very essential as we think of pushing electric mobility. So Chetan talked about a very relevant point. You know, the, we talk about the three R's, the reading, writing, arithmetic. But the three R's as far as the auto industry is concerned, which is global and which is applicable for India, is reach, range, and reassurance. And this is an important part. And he said, how do you can make it hip? Is it the in-thing? to drive an EV. That's a culture which has broadened, can we get into India? And then the entire story of infrastructure. We have budget constraints, but then budget, there can be softer aspects, which could be encouragement, or nudging, or some softer punishments, which can push people to the EV thing. That's what I get from Chetan. So that's uh, his 
vast experience of how many years now in the EV space, Chetan? Uh, over 25 years. 25. You exceed Dada by Naroji even. He didn't have that much experience when he was coined Dada, the grand old man of India. So, Ashim, uh, you are in the consultancy space and you are also in the research space. And you are watching this across segments. You are watching it in cycles, you are watching it in e rickshaws, you are watching it in two wheelers, buses. What do you think? is learnings which from abroad which should be relevant for Indian industry when the government is talking big on EV. What are the learnings you've got? Sure. I think oh, first and foremost, wherever EVs have taken off, the f driving factor has been the cost competitiveness and the economics that the customer has thought about. Like world over we say Tesla is a success story. That's because uh, when you compare the price of a Tesla, which stands in the luxury segment, the incremental price for the EV is not as high. But if we start looking at the mass market, it becomes much higher. That's why we don't see much adoption happening there. So that's one learning that we've seen across segments. Even if you see two-wheelers, uh, like there's a big success story of Gogoro in Taiwan. That's again, they were able to decouple the battery purchase from the vehicle purchase. And that's seen a phenomenal growth. The last one year, they've grown at about, about 105% increase. They've formed about 16% of the two-wheeler market there. That's again based on economics. And so that's, that's one major learning to look at. The second thing is, which I'll also take Ed's point there about public transport. Uh, there, because one entity owns the buses, the depots, and these move on a fixed route. So there, even when the government's pumped in money, we've seen large scale adoption, especially in China, and that's a model that can be replicated in many crowded cities. Lastly, I would also like to touch upon one more aspect, which is around auto components, where there's again a lot of learning from Taiwan. Taiwan had these mid-sized businesses that were doing a lot of work in electronics. And when the EVs came in, these people were quite agile to adopt to the EV ecosystem. And they've become leaders in several technology areas. For example, the Tesla Roadster, a lot of parts for that actually came from Taiwan to begin with. That is something similar even when we look at the Indian auto component industry. A lot of suppliers, the mid-sized companies, the promoter-driven companies, they've been agile in the past. They can also get into this next wave and be able to manufacture for uh, the EV ecosystem. So, Ashim, you talked of two things. One was uh, how do you decouple the battery from the vehicle, and which I think Chetan is also working on that uh, point, that so that you can bring the cost acquisition cost down, and that fear of too much of replacement cost is there. And then you're talking of the ancillary manufacturers, and public transportation is, is the which we will drive it, and I think you have a strong supporter, because he talks of public transportation can be changed in. Uh, Vinkesh, uh, nothing much is visible in the retail space in EV at the moment. Does FADA have dealers for EVs? How much do these? So, we have dealers for EV. We, but we have dealers for EV. Yeah, but yeah. looking, and because FAD also does work with NADA and also works with a lot of industry associations and you have a team, what are the learnings you think for the retail trade or for the dealer network which are relevant from the international market to relevant for India? So, actually, uh, it's more on the knowledge front. So, starting from the backup support of the after-sales service because that's the most important thing. We have to learn. We have still worked on IC for ages. So learn the EV way is a new thing what we are, when we go to NADA, we try to find out what can we learn and what are the best practices. Because as of today, you know, our uh, service support is the major part of the viability. Once the EV is launched, obviously then our service would be what? Totally battery change, tire changes and just body shop. So our overall viability goes for a toss. So that is where what, uh, as FADA, we are trying to learn from NADA, how are they viable with the pure EV dealership. Obviously, if ICE and EV go side by side, we'll be able to manage. But if it thinks, which I don't see it as very, very ne near future, like uh, Pavanji said, 2010, 18. So the transition is going on, but it's still time. So I feel uh, that is the only thing what we are learning. On the sales front, obviously, uh, selling an EV or an selling an ICE, there is nothing more to learn. It's just a uh, different technology. So we have shifted from BS0 to BS6, and uh, those learning has come on our own and slowly and steadily. That will happen. Uh, but obviously, EV will uh, create uh, some uh, acceptance issue in our sales team also, in our working also, because it's... it's a bit different than uh, what ICE is the kind of 
the sound of the engine and then <laughs> all those things moving off, no noise, nothing. Because as of today, our uh, technicians are trained to tell what is the fault in the vehicle by the sound. And EV doesn't have a sound, so it's all digital going in. So uh, things will have to be rethought, relearn, and obviously unlearn what we are doing in ISO. So unlearn, we talk of. So you talked of, uh, you know, the uncharted territory, and you talked of more than the learning. Sometimes the concerns which you're trying to find out. And if I was to use, uh, and it's relevant for the retail trade, but also for others. So in the retail trade, you are like a small boy on a seashore picking up pebbles here and there while the vast ocean of knowledge remains unknown to you. Right. Would that sum up the feeling? <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, I want to just add to what Ashim said. See, uh, we are getting a lot of hype on the ground for EV. That's a very good positive point. Uh, out of, we can say around 60, 65 customers who walk in, in the showroom are interested in EV. They, they are buying or not, that's a different scenario, but they, the first is question there. is there. When is EV coming? The curiosity is there. And uh, obviously, uh, that question, uh, the curiosity finishes as that when we start with the price gap and the time of launch. So I feel unless and until uh, EV comes as a mass production, the technology upgradation, what is happening where the battery cost goes down, when that happens, then you will see okay. that the dealers or the retail will come in for, for, forefront and EV. So Till that time, we are back bunches actually. Pankaj, uh, we know when we talk of India, we talk of 740 districts. And I understand in the cycle trade or the cycle industry, the unit of currency is not districts, it is sub-districts or tehsils, which are 5,005 lakh villages. Now, if you have to get that EV cycle across the country, across the board, what are the things which you think which is unique to India, we should do. And now moving to the next point, unlearn from abroad, because there is something very unique, what we need to do in India. And it might be not to do what they've done abroad or do something very different in India. Thank you, Arun. Uh, before I get into that, once again, I want to ask, is it all working? India will make 25 million bikes, and e-bike would be close to 1 lakh. 1 lakh over 25 million is, I don't know, 0.00 some percent. C was 2 percentage, 0 0.03 percentage, what do you talk of? 0.00 some percentage. Hmm. In the cars, again, India will make 2.5, 2.4, whatever, car market has also shrunk, and the car market is in 10,000. So is it all working? Now, what is the way? I am also sitting in the 2008 car, I want to change it, but I have got a fear. I am not going to buy an electric car. Whatever sex appeal it can have, I am scared. Range anxiety, breakdown, train mechanics, so, what is the way forward? Let's look in the mirror, and as I mentioned earlier, Europe has done it. Why not India? What's the learning? So, us, us people sitting in the room, interested for this technology, Niti Aayog, we met Niti Aayog, and you know, big effort, big statements are made. But what's the follow through? What's the net result? Is it green, red? I think it's closer to red. In Hero, we launched the Hero Electro one year back. My son is looking after the business, he's really pushing it. We've got 72% market share. It's a small base. The share is large. The growth is large. Over a period of time, the size will become big and Hero will, should continue to dominate that market. What we have done is we've broken them down into three slices. Who is going to go for it? So first is the first mover, the first mover, the young kids who are going to take in. So the first segment is health and fitness. There's a fancy cycle market which we have. We make two, two million bikes over there per year. Youngsters who go to school, who go to college, who to go for fun and recreation. There, we got a motor. It's called Electro. And we do close to 3,000 bikes a month now. And it's growing 3,000 there for India. And in this, in some time, there's going to be a convergence of motor, controller, battery, and the man, human being. And there, there'll be this heart rate modulation and you can control your, your heart rate by the cadence in the pedal. So these are the kind of things done that you can get fit, you can get energy, you can strengthen your heart, you can lose weight. So in the same time when you're going to sit in a traffic jam or go from home to work, you can use it in a productive way rather than go to the gym. Second big delivery, second big segment that we've taken is cargo, delivery bike what we call. There again, they've got segmentation. If you want a pizza, you want it in five minutes, one small packet of five kilos, 
there is one, one cargo bike for that. Then you got those multiple delivery. We have another cargo bike for that coming up. And then like an actual cargo, Amazon and Indian Postal. So cargo is going to be a big phase. Electro is going to show us lots of these bigger vehicles. There'll be bigger vehicles, could be three wheelers. That's also coming up. And the biggest one, which is our Bharat. Who knows the change may lie there? So we're going to introduce a very low cost one, close to 15,000 rupees, which we can buy. And the fuel saving pays for the installment. So the bike is technically 3,000 rupees net cost. So that is the bike we're going to introduce for the rural. These are the three slices that so, we will believe so to enter. If I take it health, the first adopters, the early adopters, because health and fitness is the buzzword, and they can pay and the affordability is not an issue. Second is cargo, which is last mile connectivity is a major opportunity and a challenge in India. And third, you mentioned was Bharat, covering each and every district and sub-district of India. Mr. Say, Ketsu, you, we talked of public transportation and you said it's fairly common. Public transportation, the challenge in China, the challenge in India. But one of the problems or challenges we have in India is, uh, what we've seen in China, there's a very strong government incentive or disincentive for EV. And second, they went very aggressive in charging infrastructure. Fortunately, I will not say fortunately, it has not happened in India to that extent. So what do you think has to be done differently for India? And you've been seven years in India, so anybody who's been more than five years in India, we count him half Indian. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm half of India. Uh, actually, I, I, I think, you know, uh, now, if I would like to say, you know, what fault we did, what's the wrong thing we did in China and what we should learn from China, two, two, uh, two points. The first point is uh, safety. You know, for electric vehicles, I think safety is, cost of course is important, but safety is also very important. You know, in the past two, two three years, you know, the Chinese government, they linked the energy density with the subsidy with the specificity. So that forced or that misled the, in the, the people to shift from NCM 611 to NCM 811, right? That is uh, caused some of the safety issues. But if, you, if, but if you see now, you can see the industry, they are coming back to the more safer, uh, much safer technology like uh, LFP, the lithium ion phosphate battery. So you will understand this. So this is one strategy for the industry in India. We should choose the much safe technology for the industry. Don't make the same, the same mistake. The same, mis uh, the same mistake. A second point is, you know, cost. India market is a very much price at cost sensitive market. So we need to get the balance of the product quality at the configurations with the cost, with the cost. So this is also very important. So two things which you mentioned, one is this cost element, the value engineering, because Indian customer is very conscious, and one is safety must be looked into initial yes, stage right. only. Yes, right, yes. Chetan, you have, I see in your recent forays, they are think Indian, you know, think global but act local, or think Indian and act Indian. So what are the two, two, three things which are very unique to India, which we have to do, and we have not, don't have to ape the West? So I think the world focuses on cars, mm -hmm. and 85% of our people go to work and back in two-wheelers, three-wheelers, and buses. Mm -hmm. So our focus should be in two-wheelers, three-wheelers, and buses. The second area is that we can't afford the, the kind of congestion would happen in the next 10 years, which means shared transportation should play a large role. Electrification should therefore connect these two species of two-wheelers, three-wheelers, and buses and shared economy. Uh, so the challenge in this area is the same. That, that three things I talked about of high price, range anxiety, and long refueling time. And, and from our perspective, what we try to do was saying, okay, if you separate the batteries from vehicles, Thank you me. can now get electric vehicles to be cost neutral. Um, if you were able to swap them in a couple of minutes, you can now address both range anxiety and long refueling time. Changing people's habits is difficult. To charge five to eight hours, or even one hour for fast charge, when someone is used to five minutes of refueling is difficult. But if you can say, listen, I can refuel you in two minutes, then this says, hey, this makes sense. So, you know, and then it's a pay-as-you-go model. I don't pay for something upfront. I pay for when I use it, right, like I do fuel. So putting the pay-as-you-go model works on this area. 
the difference I would think that, and people have tried to do this before, um, we just talked about Gogoro trying to do it. The difference what we try to say is, can this truly be an open architecture solution open. for India? So can every two and three wheeler use it, which is 22 million vehicles produced, and we do that by using one, two or three batteries. The second thing we said, what is so India specific, right? And what's India specific is robustness, reliability. I mean, your batteries have to be underwater. <laughs> your batteries have to be dropped. Um, uh, you have to operate at 50 degrees ambient, which means your stations and the battery temperatures have to be cooled, and the entire thermal management has to be looked at. So therefore, you have to create a set of technologies, starting from the cell to the pack to the solution, that is very different. The last piece of the puzzle is how can you get OEMs on board so that you can all be part of the ecosystem? The two things we try to do there. One is create standardized dock solutions that allow OEMs to get into market very quickly. And so recently when we launched with Piaggio, in a matter of 10 months, we went from concept to launch. That typically takes two to three years, and so can you reduce time to market by one third. And the last part is can everyone in an ecosystem be successful? So coming to the point on dealers, what would dealers do five years from today if they didn't have service revenue? So we actually also have our stations at dealers who are part of a franchising model and can actually earn on the revenue chain. So when they go less on service, they can actually have new models of revenue. So for me, I think if electric mobility has to work, it's going to be a set of partnerships across the ecosystem on this area, which are India-centric, and for the customer, giving him a better value proposition. So, Chetan, the way I see it, you talk of cost, convenience, and collaboration. These Very are the three, <laughs> the three Cs, huh? yes, if I'm yes. mistaken. And I, I think that, that, you know, we today have rickshaws running, and these guys do 150 kilometers, okay. right? If he gets a night shift to go, he can do another 50 kilometers. He doesn't care. So when you remove rain anxiety, the same thing with two wheelers. When, I, when you talk to customers, they only do 40 kilometers a day. But anxiety is a lot. But you know, thing. once a month, they do he does 100. And then he discounts what the OEM does. So he wants 150. If he doesn't have that, then he doesn't want to buy the product. And you can give it to him, but then you have a battery pack that's more expensive than the vehicle. So it's important so that good, these get addressed. Uh, so cost, convenience, and now we're adding comfort even also in collaboration. <laughs> Ashim, uh, quick, uh, because uh, we'll have to come to the next round. Quick learnings, what are unique which you do in India? Unlearnings and what's something unique? I mean, uh, Pankaj has mentioned it, Mr. Ritz has mentioned it. Uh, anything which you'd like to add to this? Yeah, uh, I would also take it just to another level, which is also around raw materials for all of this. Now, in India, we've seen this for a fairly long time. Whenever you're dependent on select regions in the world for importing something, you are exposed to geopolitical risk. So I think there's also one more learning that we need to take there. For example, permanent magnets is concentrated in the world. So is lithium concentrated. So like companies like Dido Steel in Japan are talking about working on materials like hot foam neodymium, which can replace permanent magnets or there is work also going around around fuel cells, there's work going around around synthetic fuels, also around sodium ion batteries. I think somewhere, and that's more for the leading players in the country and also for the government to also propel that kind of research so that tomorrow when we have a sizable EV market in India, we are also not too dependent on select regions in the world for raw materials. That's one thing. Second thing which I'll also say unique about India, we have a lot of, you know, spots. It's a lot of territory here. So we should not also face the problem that China faced around recycling. Recycling. So when we are selling these vehicles, we also should bring in something like what's been done in Europe, the EPR, Extended Producer Responsibility. You have to track your batteries, you have to get some collection mechanism in place to be able to get these back, recycle them. Because if we don't do that right when this thing is taking off, tomorrow may be become too difficult. In the lead acid domain, it's much easier, you know, uh, unorganized players can also do that smelting of lead and take it out. But in the EV domain, that will also be something that would need to be followed, in addition to the points that Chetan just mentioned around cost and, okay. you know, high reliability and all of that. So, you know, uh, what you mentioned, I go back to my school days of chemistry. You know, if you saw the periodic table, the third element in the periodic table was lithium, hydrogen, helium, lithium. And the whole discussion is starting and stopping at lithium and we don't have lithium reserves. So you're saying, look at other metals, the 110 elements in the periodic table. And they could be a combination of metals also, or complex compounds even, which could be a solution. Just don't go by the lithium strategy. And second, you said recycling. Because what you're creating, you don't want to create a Frankenstein monster. You create, do something and you follow later. Uh, Vinkesh, uh, you haven't experienced our learnings, but uh, uh, 
you said of the learning then you saw of the concerns any additional point which you comes to the top of your mind so very frankly uh, from the retail front uh, uh, the customers are interested in electric uh, if i talk of two wheeler or the passenger vehicle front uh, we don't have lot of models in the market and coincidentally uh, due apologies to the two wheeler oems all the two wheeler oems are going to a different uh, uh, retail chain so like if bajaj is launching a e bike chetak so it is not coming to bajaj two wheelers it's going to the ktm dealers so unless and until the regular chain of dealers have an ev product to show we'll not be able to justify or satisfy the customers uh, curiosity and demand there is demand there is curiosity uh, it's very clear like you saw hyundai kona being launched and uh, they they had to close the booking even today mr chaba said that they are closing the booking today uh, why do you want to close the booking you are there to produce and sell uh, let's continue with the booking so uh, why so i feel the uh, the actual push from all the manufacturer okay. side to give the products to the dealer and then see the actual response from the customers is what we as a dealers are feeling are lacking so talking of like uh, sir started that riva and e2o we are selling from our dealerships but still not all india mahindra dealers have e2o or even so even i think uh, vinkesh is saying that ev should not become a niche product yeah, which yeah, is so somehow visible at the initial part of it uh, we got hardly 10 minutes now i mean we'll have to get to the questions and uh, nabil where is he sitting nabil has said that he'll pull the plug off you know at the stroke of midnight like the government is pulling the plug off on 31st march midnight on bs4 to bs6 so we don't want to get into that so i not clear simple bullet points what is your wish list or what is your expectation from the government from the industry or it may be from customers as far as evs concerned and i wanted to know only bullet points what is your expectation i two point for the government i think uh, the with the government uh, uh, make it a policy they should take uh, more about the pollution of the energy uh, energy independence into account so the the central government as a state government both of them should make some of the policies for this industry and another point is for the for the for the industry is the ecosystem you know this is a emerging market a emerging industry so everybody from each and every sectors are partners let's work together and to create the ecosystem especially i would like to have a request to the component sector you guys need to work hard to set up the ecosystem frankly we are facing difficulties here because you know to localize the product is really hard because we cannot get qualified suppliers for the component thank you so you talked of two things one is clearly that there should be a single chain of thought from the state to the center to the towns to the villages and second you talked of an ecosystem not only in terms of production in terms of supply chain in terms of government in yes. terms of infrastructure yes coming to you pankaj what do you is your wish list Uh, what do you think needs to be done and the wish list could also be uh, rights or what about the thing the industry should do e cycles will lead this ev revolution looking at the past 10 years record that i talked about they must be included in fame 2 okay so i think he's made a very simple point e cycles are not part of fame 2 and they you put constraints in terms of range this thing how can you ignore bicycles which is the primary mode of transportation of the normal indian which is there coming to chetan uh, expectations you talked of open architecture system so that talks of collaboration <coughs> and ecosystem what is your expectation from industry and from government because government talks a lot of things and i nobody is from the government here so you can be free and free and frankly <laughs> i'm here. anyway free huh? um the uh, i think from a government point of view the policies going forward should be technology agnostic on this area uh, and they shouldn't uh, list out another uh, one part of the policy uh for example if uh you know quick charging wants to come in or flash charging wants to come in or swapping wants to come in they all should be treated equally so that consumers can look at what works for them and then choose on this area 
The second thing is when certain implementation happens, the policy should be ecosystem centric. For example, uh, recently the government has looked at the cost of uh, the GST coming down to 5%, but the GST on batteries would be 80. If a rickshaw driver wants to go charge his rickshaw or swap his battery, he'd pay GST of 18% on this. So, well, other transportation is at 5%. So therefore, all services that come in should follow what the product comes in so that ecosystem is common. So when I think they think of policies, they should be more holistic on so this area. So you talked about technology agnostic because various uh, yes. technologies, technologies, various companies can put it. And the second part you talked of in terms of ecosystem which you build in, the right hand should know the left hand. It shouldn't happen the 5 to 8 between person. Yeah, and I would just add thing. one more part that it should be right through. The vision is very big. The ground reality is they are not implemented. So often people have a chance s certifying their vehicle, getting the actual concessions. And so the, the, there needs to be effort to, you know, dot the I's and cross so, the T's to make it actually impl so, implementable. So strategy to be implementation, there should be yes. no transmission losses. If I use electrical term, exactly. I square R has to be minimum. <laughs> and you shouldn't go the peeply life that all electricities come, the bulb doesn't light. That's right. Coming to Ashim. I think one, of course, technology agnostic and added to it long term view also. This is all high capex, long gestation time items. So have a long term policy there for the government. Second thing also for the government, try and secure some of this raw material across the globe like many companies in China have done or the Chinese government has also done. Uh, third thing for the auto industry, look at developing frugal products. Where the product cannot be made frugal, look at a business model around it so that you can still bring it within the buying range of the consumer. And that also extends then to the component industry, trying to replicate some so of the Taiwanese. So look long model. term, not short term, because uh, don't sacrifice long term interest on the altar of political expediency. And the uh, second which you mentioned was a point on... Uh, Securing raw materials uh, and... Uh, raw, raw materials, because search from the periodic table or at least search elements which can be converted into this. Last, Sir. what is your uh, concept, what is your uh, expectation from the government? And also expectation, what do you think your dealer friend should See, do? From, from the dealer friend, our expectation is more from the manufacturers than oh, okay. the government. <laughs> because manufacturers should see what government are supporting them. Huh? So, uh, I remember your words when you were in Mahindra, jo dikta hai, wo bikta hai. So, okay. at least give us to sell first. Okay. And uh, practically, if you see whatever has happened in the market, wherever the product has been launched, it has been accepted. Okay. So, uh, uh, there has been a lot of talks. Uh, request that uh, if you see what car market is or the two-wheeler market is, uh, India being uh, not a very big player on the premium uh, side of products, we need uh, some uh, economy so, product so in two-wheelers and passenger vehicles. It should not, out of sight is out of mind yeah. and you need products for the masses. Yeah, that That's all we have but we, uh, Nabil, with your permission, we'll have four to five questions. My only request is please raise your hand. The question should not be more than 30 seconds. We'll have a timer, somebody look at it. And the panelist who has to answer is in one and a half minute. We'll try to squeeze in three, four questions. So who wants to take the first question? Yeah, so we'll uh, take the first question on the first row, then we'll go to the back rows. Yeah. So very quickly, my name is Thiraj Agrawal. Coming 30 from seconds, your time KPMG starts now. Global Services. Uh, my question is around automotive light weighting, uh, which is uh, being followed by a lot of uh, global manufacturers like GM and FCA. And we have not touched about the topic uh, in this session. Uh, so, like, they are already into launching SUVs, uh, they are already going to phase out their IC vehicles in next 20 years. So, can you, uh, from Pankaj sir and from uh, so, Chetan sir, can you uh, flash some light on the automotive light weighting? How so, light weighting is his question. Yeah. Uh, sure. Chetan, you can answer it. Uh, I, I think it just makes business sense because you see when you, when you, uh, when you today have an equation that says a cost of aluminium to, or steel is a certain amount, when you have electrics, you're four times more efficient, which means that if you put one extra kg of vehicle, you need more kg of batteries. And so you start to equate to say, hey, the cost, which is probably $3 per, uh, $4 per kg, now we can become $8 per kg. So automatically light weighting is a system solution to make the product cheaper versus the solution earlier to make it higher performance. It actually was makes, so people will automatically use light weighting because it makes business sense and that's when things really take off. You're into components manufacturing also, anything on light weighting you'd like to light, add what Chetan has mentioned? Light weighting is the key, key going forward with the battery dead weight and everything dead weight and all that. So in our daughter company where we make the BMW chassis in one of the daughter companies we do that, the BMW built in India. We are going to warm forming. So earlier we used to have 1.2 mm sheet metal thickness. So now with warm, we are going down to 0.9 and adding ribs to the weak areas. 
So thickness so is lot reduced, of, but uh, lot strength of, uh, is there. Work going on in this. Okay. Second yes. question. Uh, we want to go to the second row. Everybody in the first row. Sorry, anybody on the back? Not the back benches. Yeah, you are there. Yes, yes. Please, yeah. On. Uh, on theme, we are talking of learning and unlearnings from the top EV markets. Mm. Uh, but in terms of how things are going to evolve, are there some learnings and unlearnings which we can look at from how IC engine has evolved from its birth to where it is today? And can something of that be adopted into the EV as well? Uh, Again, from the consumer psyche and Who do you want to direct the question to? Ashim, uh, I'm I mean, Anyone, <laughs> for Ashim, that matter. Uh, leave it to Ashim. Maybe Chetan or uh, uh, Ashim. Chetan, you seem to be the favorite, but we have to be more democratic. We have to give others opportunity also. <laughs> sure. Also. Thank you. So, uh, I think IC engine has been a natural adoption phenomena because, you know, it started increasing and they, you know, it kept on increasing as car per thousand, kept on growing in the world. I think one thing that you can see slightly closer to that is hybrids where uh, Japan has about 20-25% penetration. So, the key learning there was, so if you see it today in the mass market segment, say up till 10 lakhs, an EV would be about 40% more expensive, a hybrid would be about 20% okay. more expensive. So decoupling rest of the technology, it's the, you know, the incremental price impact was less, so people adopted it. Second is around charging, which again was not needed, especially in the pre-PHEV era. So that's the other thing that consumer uh, convenience was the other thing to look at. So probably three Cs, cost competitiveness, uh, consumer acceptance of the technology, and also, you know, charging infrastructure or refueling infrastructure being there, that was enough for IC vehicles in terms of petrol, diesel, uh, fuel pumps. That'll be the third thing if you, you know, want to draw so, a corollary between them so and So a lot EVs. of C's and R's coming into it. Uh, any more question? Thanks. Yeah. Uh, from gentlemen, can we have the mic immediately? Uh, because it's eating into his time. Yeah. Hello. Could you make the questions short yeah. and to the so point? This is to Chetan. Uh, we know the uh, challenges. We are talking about the LFP and the NMG battery challenges. In, in terms of the 85% of the vehicles, these are the two and the three wheelers. I think the major challenge today would be the battery cooling. So, because that may not be too much of a challenge for the four wheelers and the buses, but for the two wheelers, because we are seeing the major launches only in Bangalore and Pune, but uh, the major challenges would okay. probably start happening. Yes, what are the, how is the industry actually uh, addressing those in the Shaitan. vehicles at them? Shaitan. So, very valid point. It's, 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 uh, Hi, very valid point. It's hard to air condition batteries in a two-wheeler and a three-wheeler. It's very easy to do it in, uh, in a car. Also, I think with a 48 degree ambient temperature, uh, uh, the batteries can go over 50 degrees on this area very easily and these become important. Uh, we've gone through um, over a million kilometers of this on three-wheelers on these areas and uh, we've rarely exceeded battery temperatures of 36, 37 degrees even in hot summers by using battery swapping. So when the batteries come out in the station, you cool them and then you take them back in an area. And so I feel that for two and three-wheelers, you're very right. The only way to really manage it is therefore you keep that independent where it has a chance to cool down uh, and then swapped out. Uh, and, uh, but in vehicle, it would be very expensive to do it. And so swapping would probably be the way for two and three wheelers. Ashim wants to ask, 15 yeah. seconds. Another, another thing is also battery chemistry like lithium titanium oxide, LTO, which has far higher thermal capacity, uh, thermal stability is also being evolved for applications like these. Okay, we'll come to the last question. We'll go to the last row. Absolutely the last row. Yes, yeah, we are there. Yes, please uh, give him the mic there. Yeah. He's moving to a different side. So you're not the last, but... That's the last week. Yeah. Uh, so my question would be to Ashim, sir. So, sir, you talked about the uh, frugal product and also about, you know, the various chemistry and the various elements that we can use from the periodic table. So uh, one thing is uh, to the manufacturer is the battery cost and that is uh, approximately 50 to 60 percent of the vehicle, right? But then uh, what if, uh, like, can you like s spare some points on how government can help the manufacturers to reduce the battery cost overall so that, you know, the product can be a bit more frugal? That, that is, it, it is being implemented okay. in yeah, the Western countries. Short answer because we're running sure. out of time, yeah. yeah. So I think uh, the government would give some subsidy on electric vehicles. Unfortunately, what's been seen across the globe is, especially in the PV segment, this, the, vehicle, the market has grown till the subsidy was there once this cutoff has suddenly crashed, including the recent phenomenon of it almost halving even in China. So that, I don't think more than that is something the government can do. 
what can be done is in terms of business model innovations like something Chetan is also doing or decoupling the battery cost with the vehicle cost like a battery coming on subscription so that the consumer doesn't feel the pinch at the acquisition time of the vehicle for the additional battery cost. Those kind of business model innovations might be more. Uh, we would have liked to continue with more questions but unfortunately time is out. Uh, I think I hope the objective was to generate more light than heat because heat would ultimately result in some pollution or carbon footprints. So we hope we have generated some light. And if the light is left to be generated, it can be done in the lunch table with all the eminent panelists. So thank you, the audience, for being a patient audience and all to my panelists.